first of all, uh, let me pull the audience a little bit and ask a question. How many of you uh, deliver IT services? How many of you charge back for IT services? And the nature of your chargeback, is it allocation or is it a, uh, I notice a transformation in the whole industry that is moving towards uh, IT as a service. So just IT in general as a service. You'll hear platform as a service, infrastructure as a service. And I think our mindsets need to be on IT as a service just in general. How many agree with that? Those of you who don't, you can leave the room. <laughs> so anyway, here's, uh, here's the agenda. I'm going to go through some of this very quickly. Um, as I mentioned earlier when I was up front, I'm a finance guy by background. Uh, so I spent 18 years in commercial real estate not doing IT. And then you'll say, well, what you've been doing since then? Because I'm obviously a little bit older than that, right? No? <laughs> Thank you. So anyway, uh, I'm going to go through this and I'm going to talk about, uh, about uh, d the service delivery function in the county. So let me tell you a little bit about the county. So the county is the fifth largest county in the United States. Our revenue budget is $5.6 billion, that's B. Uh, we have seven programs, that's the breakout of where that money goes. And 32 agencies and departments. And what I do is I sell my services to agencies. I have about 34, 35 defined services that I sell. And of those 34 or 35 services, only one or two are mandatory. That's different. That's very different than even most, uh, than even most uh, companies in the private sector. So I operate, I, do, I run a service delivery business and I operate under the constraints of what's called an internal service fund. Anybody familiar with what that is? Not a person. So an internal service fund is uh, functions under those constraints by a pronouncement of the Office of Management and Budget and, the, and it is very definitive about what costs can be included in what services. And why is that? The reason for that is because I sell my services to the health department who gets reimbursed by the federal and state government. So because of that, all the charges that I charge the health department must pass muster on audit from the feds or the state government, who's ever doing that. So it's, uh, I describe myself as being both, both blessed and cursed. So I'm blessed uh, because it coerces a level of financial discipline that you're unlikely to see most places. That's a key thing that's different between government and private sector. Again, I spent most of my career in private sector. So uh, that's the blessed part. The cursed part is that we do it excruciatingly manually. And that's on my plan, but I'm not there yet. So these are the basic uh, services I deliver, data center services, help desk, network, voice, information security, project management, and applications and data services. I'm not gonna read through all of them. Like I say, we have about 35 or 36 of those services. And uh, I deal with customers, and my customers are the agencies who purchase my services. And those agencies are not terribly sophisticated. So if I ask, what does internet access cost, what would you say? Zero. <laughs> I'll take two. <clears throat> so, so if you think about what it costs to deliver internet access for a, an audience of 20,000 people, you think it's free? What does it cost? What are the components of cost? Belt some out to me. The contract? What else? Infrastructure? Bandwidth. Bandwidth. Support. Support. Backup. Real estate. So anyway, my fundamental problem with my customers is I think in terms of all the components that it takes to deliver a service. And when I say to my people, 
uh, or my customers, what does it cost to deliver internet service? They'll tell me the cost of the Time Warner contract. I'll say, really? Do you have a backup? Do you have redundancy? Do you have load balancers? Do you have real estate? Do you have contracts that need to be administered? So, so we're constantly in this, oh, well, I can do it cheaper. <laughs> because they're always measuring. So that's kind of one of my next challenges is to educate I was going to say the uneducable, but that, that's probably not <laughs> To educate my customers. By the way, you don't have to like your customers, you know, just, to, just to be clear. So anyway, uh, here's the story. I'm going to run through this story very quickly. The organization was an organization built on heroics. Let me tell you a story about that. So uh, I'm in my office. One of the things that I do is I <clears throat> have a um, managed contract for cell phone services, cell, cell plan optimization. So it's not just checking that your bill is correct, it's people actively going in mid-month and changing your plan, which you can do if you're a government. You can also do it if you're an enterprise customer. So anyway, you know, one of these guys that reports to me comes in and like, we have to have a report done by in the next uh, four days. I said, really, why? So he, he tells me the guy who, uh, where this transpired. So I go and I see the guy and I said, you know, we just did this two months ago. Oh, well then we don't need it. So it was the creation of a crisis so that he, so that there could be a hero to solve that problem. The whole culture was like that. There was no focus on planning whatsoever. Organizations were siloed. They did not talk to one another. Um, assigning blame, deflection uh, and blame assignment was a big, a big thing. Resistance to change, which I don't think is unique to government, by the way, uh, and no priorities. Financial, and here's, I think he's out of the room at the moment, but here's the bullet point. Um, financial, we had a 27% budget reduction in two years. Those are big numbers. We did not reduce our service. And I'll get to how we went about that. Uh, we have an expiring staff augmentation contract. So we are out to bid. Uh, we, we are in year 11 of a contract that's extendable to 12 years. And we are out. We've received bids, you know, bids, uh, on an 800-page RF, uh, RFP. We've had vendors come into a full presentation. So the challenge that I face is how do you lead? How do you inspire people when the train is coming at them and they could be replaced if there's a change of contractor? Or a change of the geography, the real estate out of which those services are being provided. This is serious stuff. These people can walk out the door. So how do you inspire them? Um, some results. We moved to the top 10% in the industry against a benchmark. We increased customer satisfaction a sustained 15.7% by improving in 10 of 11 categories. The only category in which we did not approve was the one that was at the top in the first place. Uh, and we reduced SLA exceptions by 77%. How? Leadership, soft skills, I'm gonna talk about soft skills a little bit. Um, sustained drum beat. The Persuader, IT Service Management Principles. How many people know what IT, IL, or IT Service Management is? Very good. So uh, IT, IL was created by the English government. I don't think it was the Irish, was it? No. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was uh, created by the English government, and it's about formalizing process for high availability of your infrastructure, simply put. That whole framework has been moved to a focus of service delivery, which is really important, it's a big trend. Um, that, and then the method was plan, implement, absorb, measure. So that's what we did, and um, this is one of the things that I think we all must live by. Be transparent or be gone. Do you buy that? Boy, that's really resounding. Do you, do you guys buy that? Do you really? <laughs> Okay, good. 
So I'm going to talk about the phases of the journey. I'm going to go really quick because you're going to see this in another format. So we did IT service management training. We did a DISC assessment, and I'll show the results of that. DISC is analogous to Myers-Briggs, so, and I'll talk about that a little bit. We started with capacity management first. Why? Because one of the missions was to change a completely 100% reactive culture into a planning-focused organization. Um, then we did availability management, resource planning, and believe it or not, we had no project prioritization at the time. So that was phase two. Phase, uh, I'm sorry, that was phase one. Phase two, we formally reorganized what was my most troublesome organizational unit at the time. Uh, we input uh, methodology for service design package. Do you know what a, how many know what a service design package is? Okay, so how many would think that defining everything you need to know, including business drivers, business reason, business owner, sponsor, technical details, operational procedures in one document is a good idea. Think that's a good idea? Those of you who don't have your hands up, why do you not think that's a good idea? The idea is to have a document you can hand to operations when you are done, and they know everything they need to know to run that operation. When I got to the county, we had about 50 operating procedures. We had a lot of stuff that just flat out wasn't documented. Take a guess how many I have now. 300? Ooh, close. Three, we have 389 operating procedures, and we have metadata tagging them to organizational unit or IT service management process. Aren't you impressed with that? Isn't that good? <laughs> Jeez. Wow. That, very good. Very good. Um, <clears throat> phase three, we actually did a marketing brochure, and I'll show that in a bit. And we re-implemented Service Desk. Uh, phase four was we built uh, a network operations center and implemented a full IT service management suite. How many people know what a configuration management database is? Okay, that's keeping track of things um, and enforcing change and release management. Um, we re-benchmarked our, we did a uh, adaptive, it used to be called Adaptive Infrastructure Maturity Model with Hewitt Packard. It's now called Converged Infrastructure Maturity Model. We benchmarked ourselves against that three times and I'll get to those results. We are in the process, almost done, through about revision eight of my service catalog and then I have some things I'm going to do in the future. So here it is on a timeline. <clears throat> and um, so I pulled my, I, I'm there a couple months and I pulled my staff in and I'm, I said, I am committed to driving chaos out of the data center. I thought it was a good message. Don't you think that's a good message? What do you think the response was? I like it. <laughs> Oh, here we go again. Um, now, let me reel forward. 18, 18 months later, I had a guy walk up to me after a meeting who has, who has been there, coincidentally, for 18 years. He said to me, unprompted, unasked, he said, I've been here for 18 years. There have been many changes at the top of the organization. Nothing ever changed in how we did the work until you got here. So I thought that was nice. Don't you think that's nice? Come on, you guys. Thank you. So anyway, um, so uh, my no chaos speech wasn't terribly well received. It was this too shall pass kind of attitude. And how do you crack? How do you crack that attitude? Uh, you can do it gently or not, uh, depending on the circumstances. So uh, here's here's again on a timeline phase one, capacity reporting. Availability reporting, resource planning, and project prioritization. I'll get into a bit of how I do that a little bit later. So uh, network and platform services, that's what NPS stands for. NPS was reorganized specifically around plan and design, build and transition, and operate and maintain. So I'm in a meeting one time at the county, and uh, this conversation seems kind of odd to me. And I said, well, wait a minute. What happened, what happened to the turnover to production? The reaction, oh, we took that out of the project because we ran out of money. 
<laughs> and I'm receiving this. So uh, that, by the way, is not unique to, uh, to IT. That happens in real estate as well. Uh, phase three was uh, relaunching a service desk and a marketing brochure. I'll talk about that and show that a little bit later. Uh, phase four was a full integrated uh, IT service management suite and the network ops center. And then we're, what we're working on now is phase five. ITSM-based reorganization, service catalog, application monitoring, and service level management. And with that, I'll talk about phase one. So phase one, we did, uh, which is analogous to Myers-Briggs, we did a DISC assessment, and the, the letters stand for dominance, influence, steadiness, and compliance. And what it does is it maps you um, both, I didn't show the arrows, but here's me, my natural is over here. So I happen to be very high D, very high C. So high, highly compliant and highly dominant. It's uh, unusual. Uh, it's a low percentage of the, uh, of, the, of the people. In terms of Myers-Briggs, I'm an INTJ. So, so what we did was we mapped all the people, people who report to me and one level below me. We mapped all those people. We had them all take the test. And then we mapped them on the scale. And you know, here's the D, I, S, C. And you plot them for where they are. And then you use that, or you can use that, or you take that into consideration when you have those people perform in a team. And again, we're talking about a need for some serious transformation at this point, and this was important. I made the mistake, I was saying at lunch, I made the mistake early in my career uh, that I hired all people just like me. <coughs> you, put us all, you put us all in a room together, we can't agree on anything. Um, there's no right, there's no wrong. It's about building a team that complements each other. That's what it's about. So anyway, we did that, and then we started uh, uh, actually outside third-party third facilitator management action plan exercise. What this is, is it's a facilitated third-party guy who comes into a room. I'm not in that meeting. My direct reports are not in that meeting. It's the, low, it's the level that works, that does all the work for you. And what, it's, a, it's an environment, it's a safe haven environment where you can call out people who are above you or whatever. And the whole idea is to, it's a methodology to facilitate goal accomplishment. Little goals, little tiny goals. So an example is one of those goals was developing our first uh, template for a service design package. That was one of those goals. So, and then we tracked those goals. So to date, we've completed uh, well over 300 of those goals. And that people, what happens is these things gain a momentum. And once they gain traction and a momentum, uh, they accelerate. And people take them very, very seriously. So this is, I mean, that's a pretty nice looking graph, I think. Um, so we started with available, uh, I'm sorry, capacity reporting first. And somebody, I was meeting with someone, an IT service management expert, and he said, really? Why'd you start with capacity planning first? What do you think I told them? Why, why would you pick that one to start? Of all the IT service management. You wanted to know where you stood. Wanted to know where I stood? Wanted to, I wanted to know, yes. Let me say it a little differently. I wanted to know where I was in danger. So to move that culture from oh my God, my hair's on fire, quick, the virtual server farm ran out of memory, do an emergency PO to, you know, establishing that cadence, seeing that well in advance, planning for it in the normal course of events. So that's why I started with that. I gave, this is an example of what the table of contents looks like for each of those reports. These reports, as you can see, are, uh, close to 60 pages in length. We go through every element of our infrastructure every month. And we also have a summary 
that, uh, that tells me very quickly what I need to focus on. So for example, internet connection. Um, isn't anybody going to ask me, gee, Joel, that was, that's been yellow since... <laughs> anybody going to ask me that? No. Well, I'll tell you anyway. <laughs> so, internet capacity, we were, uh, we were getting close to saturation on internet capacity. So, so, what can you do about that? Increase bandwidth. You can increase bandwidth. Or, you can either reduce usage or increase bandwidth, right? You've got to do one of the two. Uh, so we decided to start with the, uh, with the let's plead with the people who absorb this. Now this particular service, and this is why I'm so passionate about chargeback and how you charge it back. This particular service is charged back to the customers strictly on a subscription <coughs> basis. So the chargeback methods are subscription, allocation, and usage. So subscription just means you have 100 users, you have 100 users, the total is 200, you each get half. So subscription-based. <clears throat> so we went and we said, okay. Uh, I went to the Technology Council and said, please ask your people not to listen to the radio. We realize that YouTube uh, is important, but please uh, remind them they're only supposed to be doing it for business purposes, blah, 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 blah. Guess what the net result of that was? Zero. Uh, so okay. So I thought, okay. Well, let's see. Let what's the next step? Let's see what we can do next. So what we decided to do next was we decided to measure the average beta use per headcount for the agencies <coughs> for my customers, and then go and say, "You're a good boy." And John, look at you. You're twice the average. Guess what? The, and we did that. We uh, hit the top. The the top. Uh, eight agencies, I think it was, that were above the average across the county. Guess what the result of that was? Zero. Um, there's a little bit of a lack of accountability problem in government, have you? <laughs> um, so what did we do next? So next I decided, okay, we're going to see if we can change this to a usage-based cost. So I went to my cost folks, and on that earlier slide, there, that was actually a summary. We identified 72 line items on what that cost. And the idea was, was to switch that to a consumption-based pricing. That was the concept. The bad news was that we would have had to have bought more appliances than we would have saved, so it was cheaper to buy the bandwidth, so I ended up buying the bandwidth. <laughs> oh well. Can't win them all. So anyway, we bought bandwidth on that one. Uh, we, do a, we do a computation every single day. We use a product called Clarity. How many people are familiar with that? So uh, Clarity is one of the project portfolio management tools. It does some things very, very well. One of the things it does extremely well is resource planning. So we have a rolling three-week schedule and every single day I get a number. And that number is what we call the clarity effectiveness factor. The clarity effectiveness factor is the, it's a three week rolling window, detailed task level rolled up of all the projects. So the numerator of that number is the total tasks. The denominator is, I'm sorry, the total current tasks and the denominator is the total tasks. <coughs> What's missing from the numerator is the late tasks. So if I get that number and it's 94%, I know 6% of the ta uh, tasks in the project, in, the, in a roll up of all the projects, are late. And so I see that number every day. Um, uh, I, get, oops, I get that number delivered to me every day. And I also track what the total FTEs are. Now just to give you a sense of the volume decline, we went from <clears throat> having 77 concurrent projects two years ago, uh, in addition to all the O&M, to having about 35, 35 now. So serious downturn. We went from about uh, averaging 12 FTEs down to five. And then this is my, uh, so that's, uh, that's the, uh, here's the, the one before was the other, turned the other way. This is by project, the other one was by 
organizational unit. And this is one of my favorites. I get a list in, right in that email that tells me which projects have late tasks. So if they're significant, I can contact my friendly project manager and say, hey, what up? <laughs> so that's phase one. Um, the way this chart works is the orange colored boxes are kind of major, uh, major things we did and the blue colored bo boxes are metrics or results and I'll get to the metrics and results at the end. So next, uh, we reorganize the Network and Platform service, Services Division formally around plan and design, uh, build and transition, operate and maintain. And if you were in plan and design, you planned or designed all the time, 100% of the time. So the, uh, the big idea around this was to try to test that organizational construct within the confines of one of the organizational units to see if it worked. Uh, and then also in this phase, we uh, instituted the service design package methodology, which I mentioned before. So, here is how the organization looks. And so, uh, I don't need to tell you, this is, this is applications, process, uh, and databases, and this is infrastructure, basically. So, this group in infrastructure, network, and platform services, we actually formally, uh, organized around these three disciplines. When I broached this concept with some of the people uh, that report to me and were, have been there a long time, guess what kind of response I got? Oh, we can't do this. Mm -hmm. Why not? The agencies will never pay for planning. And uh, so, so my management style got slightly more directive at that point. Uh, because basically, you know, I've been a planner my whole career, and this guy's sitting here telling me that's useless, we can't do that. So uh, I got a little bit more directive, and we move forward. Um, this I'm not going to go over, but the, these are, we did go through the discipline of uh, figuring out exactly what tasks were done in each of those, in each of those three groups. Planning, design, build, and transition, and operate, and maintain. Service design package. <clears throat> I joked that the, the process at the county used to be buy, build, deploy, plan, design, rebuild. <laughs> <laughs> you chuckle, but that was far more the case than not. So, uh, so anyway, we put in a service design package methodology, which again is about finding out everything you need to find out before you build something and plop it into production. After We've done about 35 of these now. Uh, this was our first one. And after it was done, I asked the team to go back and tell me what they found that they likely would not have found earlier. And I asked them to do likely, partial, or for sure they would not have found it. In that particular exercise, there were 12. One they likely would have found, four were maybes, and seven they definitely would, have, would not have found. So this demonstrates the value of this kind of discipline in this kind of process because those seven things, they could have been found one at a time. Now, can you imagine the cost of rebuilding a, a set of 20 servers seven times? I mean. The value proposition is just very, very, very clear. So that's service design package. Phase three, uh, we actually did our first bona fide cloud offering. We uh, re-implemented, we used <coughs> Remedy, BMC Remedy, and we re-implemented that in a cloud offering through our provider. So it is a bona fide cloud offering. When I say it's a bona fide cloud offering, I mean it. It meets all the five characteristics of a cloud as defined by NIST. So it's a real cloud, Mr. Cloud Researcher. Um, and then we did the marketing brochure. So let me show you the marketing brochure. This is the county marketing brochure. That's mine. Agency success is our mission. What's important about this, and I used an S4 logo. Why do you think I chose S4? What do you think it means? Success. 
you don't know, so therefore you open. <laughs> <laughs> I did do some time in marketing. So anyway, uh, county brochure, my brochure, <coughs> looks the same. You know, so this is the voting districts, that's the voting districts by color and our network imposed on top. So the four S's are services, savings, skills, and success, and on the success side, uh, we got testimonials from some of the more powerful people in the county. So, here's the definition of mojo. Mojo is the moment when we do something that's purposeful, powerful, and positive, and the rest of the world recognizes it. So our mojo moment came in November of 2009. In perspective, most of the staff that works at the Orange County Data Center has been there at least 15 years. No one could remember a month where there wasn't a service level breach ever. November 2009. And I believe that this was really when the tide turned, when the this too shall pass people suddenly realized they were being swept into something that was far bigger than them and that they damn well better get on board. Uh, and I think that the whole program and uh, picked up momentum at that mojo moment. So there's my brochure that I just showed you. And then we move on to phase four. So phase four is the implementation of a full IT service management suite, including configuration management database. We actually have one and we actually use it and it's actually updated all the time. It's not vaporware. And we increased our uh, focus on the network operations center. So in the network operations center, one of the services I offer, we offer operating system and down full service servers uh, at a certain rate per month. And <clears throat> so that, that number is included and we do 24 seven monitoring and all the patching and all that stuff. There's a whole, there's actually like a 20 page document that describes with great specificity everything that is involved in that service. So server uh, network monitoring, server monitoring, that's all done at the uh, Orange County Data Center. The release of our integrated IT service management suite, this is what uh, the yellow was what we had and the blue is what we now have. The key of this, how many use an integrated IT service management suite? No, one, two. How many people know what it is? Okay, so the, the whole concept, again, it's about infrastructure uptime, and we talked about table stakes. Well, let me tell you about table stakes. There's a place not too far from here that has about 20,000 users, coincidentally, it's not me, uh, and I was meeting with them, and I was talking to them about what we'd done. I met with them, it was April 29th, and they told me from... Christmas to that date, their entire network flatlined 17 times, once for two days. <laughs> now, if you're a service provider and collecting money for that, uh, you've got some serious work to do. So I think it resonates uh, how important that is. So anyway, this is all about having uh, everything linked together, incidents, incident problem, management change, configuration, all of that stuff linked together in one place. It's an important discipline beyond the, beyond the scope of uh, today's presentation, however. So now I'm gonna talk about uh, some results. Importantly, these are, uh, these are incident results as of through September of this month, uh, of this year, I'm sorry. And uh, you can see there's some level of volatility. This was a release of a new ERP system. This spike was a release of a new uh, tax assessment system. But in, what's important is despite that volatility, I mean, we, this area, by the way, the data are suspect because that was right when we released our new system. But importantly, we are resolving uh, between 99 and 100% of those tickets as they come in. Not bad. Service level, uh, so 
it's entitled SLAs. They're not really service level agreements. What they are is service targets. So when I sell my services to an agency, there's a document that accompanies that, and that document has service levels in it. But they're not really SLAs, because I don't pay back if I don't meet it. So it isn't quite like that. Um, but most people would know them as SLAs, which is why I entitled the slide that. In calendar year 2009, we had about 500 SLA exceptions. In calendar year 2010, we had 100. That's an 80% reduction. Average time to resolve tickets went from 12 days to two and a half. It's a 75% reduction. So there is something to this organized process approach to things, I think. Um, and then we did, how many people have ever done a converged infrastructure maturity model? Do you know? So this is an assessment where, uh, other than mid-range and mainframe, we're uh, a Hewlett Packard shop. Hewlett Packard, through some of its bars, offers a service and it's called uh, Converged Infrastructure Maturity Model. When we started this, it was called Adaptive Infrastructure Maturity Model. What it is, is it looks at four domains, technology and architecture, management tools and process maturity, culture and, uh, culture and staff maturity, demand supply and IT governance. And it has a series of questions. They come in and spend like a day and a half with you the first time and then you can uh, answer those questions as you go on. Importantly, uh, and the reason I was so interested in doing this, is importantly, it's a lot about people and process. Therefore, I could make improvements without spending money, which is perfect for government. Actually, it's probably perfect for everybody. So um, this, uh, these are just some of the categories of those questions. You can look at them, but server utilization, so how effective are you at your virtualized infrastructure? Uh, are processes standard? Is there SLA standardization, or do you have different SLAs with different clients, that sort of thing? Uh, so these are the things that they did. And here's uh, the results. These are the results of, from July of this year. And what do you think the orange is? Orange County, good, good guess. So the orange is Orange County and the blue is the public sector average. So I feel pretty darn good about where we've come to and I'm gonna show that on the next slide. Uh, but you can see that in technology and architecture, tools and process, culture and IT staff maturity and demand supply and IT governance, we are performing well above what the public sector average is. One of the most useful pieces of data that I have. And I think it's uh, really important and it's really good because if, the, there, if there's a bias at all in these numbers, the bias would be to the more sophisticated. So most of the people that use this are you know, states and big, big operations, not little mom and pops. Here it is another way, um, stacked up uh, by percentage. And what the blue is, is of those 50 characteristics, it's the percentage where we were equal to the public sector average. And on the top is the burnt orange is where we were better than the public sector average. So uh, we, did, we did our first one in December of 09. We were top 46% and I thought, yeah, that's pretty good, that's not bad, um, given where we are and where we started. We had it done again in July 2010 and we moved to the top uh, uh, top third, and then we had it done uh, just recently, July 2011, and we are in the top 10%. And oh, by the way, here's our headcount. Our headcount went down 27% at the same time. Big numbers. A big deal. A big story. Now, I would also tell you that uh, you know, the further down you are, the easier it is to improve, but we won't go into that. <laughs> uh, this is our customer, uh, customer survey data. We do, a, every six months, we do a customer survey, and they ask the same questions all the time. And uh, uh, I struggle with how to present this because I'm really not a fan of this type of graph, 
but the blue the blue line is uh, where we started uh, in the first half of 2009 and uh, the green is where we are now and the red was in between arithmetically or mathematically uh, we've improved a sustained 15.7 percent even though we reduced staff 27 percent now I would also tell you that we we are out of runway I, we I do not believe that we can go any further without reducing service levels we uh, reduced staff by 65 people to get here phase five is what we're uh, working on now and I'm just about done with my uh, uh, service catalog how many people have a service catalog one uh, how many people think it's important and, and the rest of you don't think that's important you don't think it's important to be able to articulate to your customers what you're delivering to them I think it's kind of important in fact I think it's critical so uh, so uh, here's uh, here's kind of just general summary of what our uh, service catalog will look like uh, hopefully it'll be printed by the time I get in there tomorrow but we go through a, a brief service description what's included how we charge service tips and additional information so again we offer 35 or so of these services and we define them like this it's a pretty standard approach to delivering uh, a service but the important uh, one of the most important things for me is how we charge so again this is internet service provider and so the story I, I told this is included in the county network services rate which uses active directory so it's a headcount based uh, subscription based pricing on this so where do we go from here uh, I think one of the focuses is what's kind of the next step or where do you think your organization is going next well I have an answer to that so you may recall that the concept of breaking the organization into plan and design build and transition and operate and maintain was in the network and platform services group well if you think about that, that so that was kind of our trial basis and I would tell you that it worked uh, it worked better than I thought it would work actually uh, but there's no reason that those functions planning and build and transition shouldn't be over all these functions so that's kind of where we're going next we will we will formally reorganize and move uh, planning and build and transition up over all of these groups and to do that uh, we'll have to identify probably people from all most if not all of these groups to go into those groups up top conclusions and lessons learned number one Financial distress clouds have their sil silver linings in IT environments. Do you think we could have absorbed as fast had we not been in a financial crisis? I don't think so. I think that helped. Um, it takes IT mojo-driven strat strategy to implement sustained continued improvements in financial distress. Uh, so it takes consistency. One of the things I neglected to mention when I did the disk analysis is the most influential who do you think, where do you think the most influential person in driving these continuous improvements resides? Customer. No, not the, no, not the customers. It's one of the operations guys. So it's not me. It's not my direct reports. It, it's a guy who happens to have the profile of being a persuader. So kind of a different... Uh, different so he's kind of mustering the troops getting them to buy in using logic and sales skills that sort of thing uh, new leadership common goals common messages uh, establishing a drumbeat of consistency so uh, when John was introducing me I think he described me as no it wasn't stubborn it was persistent uh, so persistent so persistent drumbeat persistent uh, persistent at this persistent at recognizing the people when they've done something great these people did something great and you put them in a room and you fire them up and you turn them loose 
That's what you, that's what you do. Uh, establish key measurements and show in the customer surveys. So we talked about measurements in the panel. You know, measure what's important, publicize it. You're, make sure your people know what you'll be measuring because if you choose what to measure and they know they will be measured by it, they will improve it. Uh, establish a consistent program of account uh, accountability. And then finally, and this one was a mistake I made, we did, we did our first uh, converged infrastructure maturity model assessment after we uh, implemented improvements. <coughs> I did it consciously. I absolutely did it consciously because I knew that it would have looked awful. Now when I look back, I wish I had done it before I had implemented any improvements because the improvement in that metric would have been even more dramatic. So that's my, I made a mistake moment for today. <laughs> and with that, I will take questions. Yes, sir. Did you, when you started on your journey, did you um, roadmap those phases and the elements of the phases? And if you didn't, how did they evolve or change as you went forward? Yeah. So, uh, so I think Harvey really had this nailed when he said, you set your vision, uh, but don't let it constrain you too much. So I didn't know what kind of pace we would be able to do. So if you talk to people about the amount of change uh, that we've, uh, that my organization has absorbed in that period of time, I mean, it's a, this is a big deal. This is a different, this is a very different place than it was when I started there. I mean, very different. Um, and when we started, I knew we had to move the culture, and I knew it was a big move, and I knew it was serious. What I did not know was I didn't know how fast people could absorb it and how fast it could be instantiated. So what you, what you try to do <clears throat> is you try to push that as fast and as hard as you can without breaking the organization, and we pushed it hard enough that I know that uh, we were on the brink. Uh, I mean, we were on the brink of the wheels falling off. We pushed that hard because this is a lot. This is huge change. Now, a testament, a little testament to that. We have those map management action plan sessions. You know, the working level, uh, protected environment and the like. And somebody said something in one of those meetings. I don't go, so I wasn't there. Somebody said something in one of those meetings and the security guy turns and looks at him and goes, we don't do work like that around here anymore. I mean, in a chastising way. And I thought, wow, isn't that wonderful? I mean, that's a real change in culture. So, that, so the answer is, one of the drivers, one of the drivers for me for this is we have a, a managed service contract RFP on the street. Back, back here, we were looking at a three-year transition. There's no way. I mean, we didn't have, you know, 90% of the documentation didn't exist. I, I mean, we were so far away from that. So I knew that that train was coming, so I felt obligated to get us as ready as I possibly could before that. And today, I'm very comfortable that we, my group, not my customers, my group is very ready to absorb that. In fact, we run much more like a managed service operation than we do like a staff <coughs> implementation. Other questions? Yes, sir. Um, how did the people respond when you uh, got them all on the disk? Did they have any feedback and said, I don't want to take this? And uh, once, once you've done it, how yeah. do you do your teams? Yeah, so, um, so nobody was sensitive about taking it. Uh, I think they were a little bit more sensitive when the wheel came out and it showed where they were. And you know, so when we launched that, we, uh, we talked about there is no wrong and right or better or not so better. That's not what it is. That's not what it is at all. Um, so we kind of got them over that hump with that. But when I picked the person that I wanted to drive this, 
and put him over a different organizational unit, it was, oh, he could never possibly do that. And I said, I bet you he can. So. How hard was it to instill the customer service aspect into the IT department? So I would tell you, I would tell you, we're still not quite there. Um, I, I do believe that we've made remarkable progress. I think people understand that uh, that that's what drives it. We, we're in business. If there are no customers, there is no need for me and my department. So I think that's a little different. Uh, then there used to there used to be a, you know those damn customers are a pain in the tail uh, you know I, I think so I think we've moved that needle uh, a good way but I don't think I don't think we're where we need to be we do have people however now which is completely different now we have people who are thinking about service the the discipline of going through the service catalog has actually uh, resonated the concept of IT as a service. And now people are thinking, thinking about what services don't we deliver that they might want? Should we, should we have a platform as a service offering uh, that, can be, that we can automate the provisioning? What does a standard server look like? So we're, we're moving in that direction, but again, I, I would say we're better, but nowhere near where I think we should be. With the uh, goal of efficiencies, and say your, your immediate customers were, say, the wholesale market, were the citizens of Orange County uh, saved money? Can you address how that passed through? So, uh, so absolutely. Uh, I mean, uh, however, you know, one thing, one thing that I learned is you really focus on your primary customer. <clears throat> and let me do that by example. So by example, I used to work for the Rouse Company. Well, me getting into the retailer's pants, it's not so, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. There's not a lot of high value payback for that. Uh, the other thing I would tell you, do we have any members of the press in here? Good. Uh, <laughs> so, so government is, if you want to work in government, consider this perspective. Where can you get low pay and Paint a target on yourself to be publicly humiliated at every possible venture imaginable. That's what government's. That's what working for government is. Let me give you an example. There was a performance audit of the whole IT department, including the pieces that don't report to me. <coughs> My pieces. There was uh, about 15 pages about. Look at all the stuff the new CTO has done. This is good. He's benchmarking. He's benchmarking costs. Blah 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 blah. Then on the bad side, there was some other stuff. What do you think got in the paper? The other stuff. Only the other stuff. So, uh, so, so making that value connection with the con constituency isn't quite where you might think it would be. However, uh, it is. In the agencies, in the departments of public safety, that's a very uh, good exercise. We also do some, uh, I sell my services not only internally, but I actually sell services to others. So for example, LA County has more compute equipment in my data center than I have in my data center. <laughs> LA County's huge. Um, so, so I actually sell those services uh, uh, to others. So they are my customers, uh, so, and then they serve constituencies. So the second part of the question, those constituents, did they, were they able to start saving money or were prices you know, that they were charged, the citizens of the county, still increasing? So I can't attest with any detailed knowledge of that. What I can tell you is that my rates have come down over the last two years. Those are the rates that go in for reimbursement you know, for the feds and the state. Uh, so they should be reflected in there, but they would be so buried no one would ever, no one would ever know or see. Well, first of all, I mean, that's incredible transformation. It's really inspiring. Thank you. Um, question is, how, how iterative, iterative was the process once, I mean, it looks very linear here, but when you had lear learnings would emerge as you move forward, how often was it tweaked and... Oh, oh my goodness. So, so if you, uh, the best example I can think of is if you look at our uh, capacity report today, everyone I show that capacity report to goes off the charts, world class. 
if I show my first one, it's probably not quite uh, not quite there. So, and we've added things over over the years. So, in the case of capacity reporting, by the way, I happen to be big on green IT. So, we compute our power usage effectiveness, which is an emerging data center power effectiveness factor in that report. So, so uh, so small, incremental, consistent. Uh, improvements in all that stuff. Our service design packages are much better now than they were when the first one was. So that that continuous improvement, I don't even have to drive that at all anymore. I mean, that's that's the people that's the people doing their thing. What about all your new documentation? How do you maintain it? So uh, so all our new documentation, we use SharePoint. And we build workflow and uh, automate it. So documents come out there on an automated basis when you put them in. So if you put them in and they're supposed to come out quarterly, they come out quarterly into a workflow for review uh, of our folks. Uh, all, my, all my people wrote all that documentation, in addition to running everything every day. OK, I'll ask you a question. Uh, you mentioned that you have been operating your department like a professional. But at the same time, you mentioned you have a budget for a professional person. So is it a public sector or a cost So uh, I'm new to, So the question is, uh, I mentioned numbers. And uh, the question is, am I a profit center or a cost center? And the answer is neither. So what, I, what my objective is, I'm precluded from making profit. Uh, so what my objective is at the end of the year is that the rates that I set in, the, set in the beginning of the year equal make me neutral at the end of the year. So I, I don't make profit. Which it, I'm glad you asked the question, which is an interesting perspective. So when I think about cloud computing, you look at, uh, you look at the research and where that's gone. At first it was cloud computing cheaper. Then it's now, well, maybe not. So, so it's unclear. But if I look at cloud computing, after you go through all the details, let me tell you where I think I am. Cloud provider has a need to make profit. I have no need to make profit, so cloud provider is up here. Cloud provider has efficiencies uh, at a scale that I can't achieve, so you know, so he comes down here. So that's kind of how I think about it at the end of the day. I know you're doing some research. That's just my two cents. <coughs> How do you get the staff augmentation on board? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so, so they are staff augmentation people, and like I said, I think there were there were um, there were people who weren't really bought in, but they've been swept away with the enormity of what's been happening, and it's uh, I, I don't think there's any recalcitrance left actually. Great. Uh, we are out of time for this session. Joel will be around, so if any of you have any questions, I guess you can follow up with Sure. You. Joel, as a citizen for Orange County, of Orange County, thank you so much <laughs> for <laughs> <all> <laughs> <that>. <laughs> my constituency. Yeah. <laughs>